Dialogues, your daily dose of health and medical news. I'm Mr. Zaman and here's what I bring to you all from the world of medicine. Potential threats to heart health due to extreme weather. The recent analysis included 2.28 million adults from the five cohort studies conducted in Italy, Germany, the UK, Norway and Sweden between 1994 and 2010. Participants with and without cardiovascular disease as baseline were included. Data on mortality and new onset disease were collected through death and disease registries and follow-up surveys. Daily average air temperatures at participants' home addresses were collected from local weather stations or estimated using modeling of temperature data from weather stations. The analysis found increased risks of death from cardiovascular disease overall and ischemic heart disease in particular as well as an elevated risk of new onset ischemic heart disease associated with cold weather with an approximately 10 degree celsius temperature drop from 5 degree celsius to minus 5 degree celsius there was a 19 percent greater risk of death from cardiovascular disease there was a four percent higher risk of new onset ischemic heart disease associated with an approximately 11 degree celsius temperature drop from 2 degrees Celsius to minus 9 degrees Celsius. The heat was not related to detrimental effects on the overall study population. However, the temperature rises from 15 degrees Celsius to 24 degrees Celsius were associated with 25% and 30% elevated risk of death from cardiovascular disease and stroke respectively in people with heart disease at baseline worsened the impact of heart attacks among heavy smokers. The risk of death or poor prognosis after a heart attack is more than 20-fold higher in smokers with exhaled carbon monoxide levels above 13 ppm, indicating heavy smoking and inhalation of smoke. That's the finding of late-breaking research presented at ESC Congress 2022. During a two-week period in April 2021, expiratory carbon monoxide was measured within two hours of admission in all consecutive adults hospitalized for acute cardiac events in 39 intensive cardiac care units or ICCU in France. A total of 1,379 patients were studied. Patients were asked about their smoking status, 33% were non-smokers, 39% were former smokers and 27% were active smokers. Carbon monoxide level was similar in non-smokers and former smokers and significantly higher in active smokers. The investigators analyzed the association between carbon monoxide level and the primary outcome of in-hospital major adverse events which was a composite of death, resuscitated cardiac arrest or cardiogenic shock. A total of 4.2% of patients experienced a major adverse event while in the hospital. Carbon monoxide level was significantly associated with major adverse events in active smokers. The researchers identified 13 ppm as the best threshold for predicting a worse prognosis. The odds of a major adverse event were 23-fold higher in smokers with a carbon monoxide level above 13 ppm as compared with 13 ppm or below after adjustment for factors that could influence the relationship including age, sex, diabetes, smoking status history of cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, history of cancer, and reason for admission. In smokers with a carbon monoxide level of 13 ppm or below, the rate of major adverse events was similar to non- or former smokers. Nearly 19% of active smokers had a carbon monoxide level above 13 ppm, compared with less than 2% of non- or former smokers brain region responsible for effortful helping behavior. The research published in Current Biology shows that effortful altruistic behavior choices people make that help others takes place in a different part of the brain from that used to make physically demanding choices that help oneself. The area identified called the anterior cingulate cortex gyrus or ACCG is located towards the front of the brain. It's known to play a role in social behavior but has not previously been linked to putting an effort to help others. Interestingly, the researchers found that the ACCG is not activated when individuals make effortful decisions that only benefit themselves. In the study, the researchers worked with 38 participants aged between 18 and 35. All participants were each asked to take part in effortful decision-making tasks and to complete a questionnaire to self-assess their empathy levels. The participants made decisions while undergoing a functional MRI scan. This identifies different areas of the brain which are activated while people made decisions to either work or rest to help themselves or someone else. If they chose the work option, they had to squeeze a device that measured their grip strength. The team found that the ACCG was the only brain area that showed the effort pattern where people made these decisions to help someone 
else but it did not activate at all when they made decisions to put an effort to reward themselves intriguingly those people who had said they were very high in empathy had the strongest effort patterns in ACCG researchers also found that those people who represented effort most strongly in the ACCG also went on to put in more grip strength to help out how maternal fat metabolism very early in pregnancy and fetal abdominal growth may affect child weight and adiposity by 2 years of age a new study led by researchers at the university of oxford in collaboration with university of california in lancet diabetes and endocrinology identifies as early as the 5th month of pregnancy patterns of fetal abdominal growth associated with maternal lipid metabolites that track newborn growth adiposity and development into childhood These fetal growth patterns are also associated with blood flow and nutrient transfer by the placenta, demonstrating a complex interaction between maternal and fetal nutrition early in pregnancy that influences postnatal weight and eventually adult health. The researchers monitored the growth inside the womb of over 3500 babies in 6 countries using serial fetal ultrasound scans throughout pregnancy and analyzed blood samples taken from the women early in pregnancy and from the umbilical cord at birth. They then monitored the growth and development of the infants until 2 years of age. Stephen Kennedy, who co-led the study, said This landmark study has provided valuable new insights into the biological origins of childhood obesity, which is one of the most pressing public health issues facing governments around the world. The findings could contribute to earlier identification of infants at the risk of obesity. That's all for today. Stay tuned to Medical Dialogues for latest updates. Never miss a medical update from Medical Dialogues. Like, subscribe and press the bell icon.